there's an aspect of the Buddha's awakening that often gets overlooked. And that's the social dimension and the second knowledge he gained that night. You may remember the second knowledge was it responds to a question, why is it that rebirth goes up and down? You can be born as something good and then fall, and then go back up again and go down again. The analogy the Buddha gave was like throwing a stick up into the air. Sometimes it landed on this end, sometimes it landed on that end. Sometimes it landed splat in the middle. Why? And in the course of the second knowledge, you saw it's because of the karma beings. Stated simply, those who acted on skillful intentions tended to go to good destinations. Those who acted on unskillful intentions went to bad. It's made complex by the fact that you're not doing just one action per lifetime. You're doing many actions. And your views can change, for the better or for the worse. So you can, it's possible you can do good things now and go to a bad destination, or do bad things now and go to a good destination because of the other things you've been doing and the views you hold. But where do you get those views? One of the sources is how you attend to things, in other words, what you notice, what you don't notice. The other source is other people. Those who acted on skillful intentions tended to listen to the noble ones, have respect for the noble ones. Those who acted on unskillful intentions tended to have no respect, or maybe they respected those who they shouldn't respect. And it's a result of this insight that the question of who you hang out with, who you associate with, plays such a large role in the practice. As the Buddha said to Ananda one time, admirable friendship is not just half of the practice, it's the whole. Without having the Buddha as our admirable friend, we wouldn't know anything about the possibility of putting an end to suffering. It's because he pointed this out to us. Not only pointed it out to us, he also set a good example. It's not just a question of having an admirable friend, it's engaging in admirable friendship. Noticing what good qualities the admirable friend has, and trying to replicate them in your own behavior. The four qualities the Buddha pointed out to, and these apply not only to monks, nuns, but also to lay people, were one, conviction, two, virtue, three, generosity, and four, discernment. And these are the qualities that create the culture of awakening, the culture of the practice. There has been a tendency, especially in the 19th and 20th century, to reduce everything to technique. You learn a particular technique, you follow it, and you gain awakening without really having to engage with anyone else or change your values. But the problem is, Focusing exclusively on a technique without the culture means that once the technique is placed in a different culture, it takes on a new meaning. The other day I read a piece by someone claiming to be a lineage holder in the forest tradition, talking about how she had trouble one time in a meditation retreat because she had chosen a really nice Zafo and a really nice place in the room then gone to dinner, come back, and someone else had taken her place. Then she struggled with this for quite a while. Now, this is the sort of thing you might talk to, to a psychotherapist. But I can imagine if she had actually talked to a John Cha about this, he would have said, look, you don't need a Zafu at all. Go and sit under a tree. Different set of values. No coddling, no pampering. Learning some contentment. This is one of the aspects of the culture of the noble ones. You're content with the things that come to you on an external level, in terms of food, clothing, shelter, medicine. And in terms of shelter, if your zafu is in the wrong place, 
or a place you don't like, or you put up with it. Because there are more important things you've got to focus on. That's not the case that having the right safu or the right spot in the room is going to make the difference between whether you can awakening or not. It's more a question of the qualities of mind that you develop, the strengths of mind that you develop. So that's what happens when you take the technique out of the culture. Things can get distorted. So think about what it means to engage in admirable friendship. Conviction means being convinced of the fact of the Buddha's awakening and of the many different things he came to know in the course of his awakening. He pointed out three as being really important. One is the fact of rebirth, and the fact that your rebirth goes up and down, up and down. It's not a steady, nice progress. Another thing you hold to is the fact that rebirth depends on your karma, as I said. So what, what that does, it means that you, it focuses you really intensely on being convinced in the power of karma, power of your actions, what you do, what you say, what you think, intentionally will have an impact on shaping your life. And so you have to be careful about what you do and say and think. Then there's the whole point that you can put an end to suffering through your efforts, but not to take on this act of conviction or this type of conviction. It means that you have respect for your, ad your admirable friend. This is why we have such a vocabulary of respect around here. We respect the Buddha for what he shows about the potential we have within us. He has us respect our desire for true happiness, one that it is possible in general, and two that we are men, women, children, young, old, can do it. Because that's the message in the awakening. It is possible to find a dimension that you touch inside that is totally free from suffering. I've had people ask, well, given that we're conditioned beings, how can we know anything unconditioned? That's putting the cart before the horse. You're defining yourself, and then in your definition you're limiting yourself. As the Buddha said, no matter how you define yourself, you're going to limit yourself. So put the question of defining who you are aside. Focus on learning from other people who are skillful. How do you act skillfully? How to talk to yourself to behave more skillfully. How to stick with the path. Those things are worth thinking about. So that's how the Buddha progressed. He tried, as I said, to find what was skillful. And he didn't rest content. I found a level of skill that brought him to something that was totally unconditioned. And given that he found out what it is possible to know, that was the first thing. That was the first principle. Then the next question is, how do you define yourself? Well, for the purpose of the path, you define yourself as competent to do this, confident that you can responsible for your actions, and someone who really desires a happiness that doesn't disappoint, that doesn't harm anybody. So there are a lot of value judgments there, and there's a, a lot to the path as a whole that involves value judgments. We see this in all the rest of the qualities of an admirable friend. Virtue is good. Virtue is important. In fact, it's so important that the Buddha said losing your virtue would probably want to be one of those serious losses in your life. Which means that when the choice comes between maintaining the precepts and maybe having to sacrifice other things, or sacrificing the precepts for the sake of other things, you sacrifice the other things. That's a very strong value judgment. And to maintain it, you want to live with people who maintain those values as well. So again, there's a social aspect of the practice. 
It's part of the culture. The same with generosity. When you're able to share, you're happy to share. You try to develop that quality of the mind where you can see that you may have something more than you need, and you're happy to give it to others. You think about their needs as well. This expands your mind. And it's the basis for the whole culture we have here. The economy here at the monastery is an economy of gifts. You notice that we don't have courses where you have to pay X amount or there's a suggested donation for how much you pay. The best way to repay the, the teacher is to put the teachings into practice. The teachings are given as a gift. Everything is given as a gift. You look around the room here. The money that went into building this building was a gift, every piece. So we're living off the generosity of others, which requires that we develop an attitude of generosity as well. As the Buddha said, if you're not generous, if you're stingy with your belongings, stingy with your dharma, you can't even get into right concentration, much less gain awakening. The fourth quality is discernment. It's defined as penetrative knowledge of arising and passing away. And you're not just watching things coming and going and accepting them. The knowledge has to be penetrative, which means that you understand cause and effect. When something good comes, why does it come? And particularly, where does it come from in your own mind? When something bad comes, where did it come from in your own mind? Because this is the knowledge is meant to give you understanding into where suffering comes from and how you can put an end to it. And you realize that your attitude towards suffering has to be noble. In other words, you accept responsibility for whether you're going to suffer or not. And then you look into the machinations of the mind to see where is it that you're creating suffering. You may say, well, there's pain here, there's pain there. Well, why do you suffer around the pain? It's the stories you tell to yourself and the images you hold in mind. The way you grab hold of a pain. You may notice this as you're breathing in, breathing out, and there's a pain in part of the body. There may be a tendency to actually try to use the pain as part of the body that's going to do the breathing. In other words, you're taking on the pain and in grabbing onto it for the future, for the next breath. We're not talking about long-term future here, just immediate future. Do you have to do that? Can you see the pain as something that's past, 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 going away, going away? Now, does that change your relationship to it? How does that change the relationship to how much you can endure? Because those are the values that you look for in this culture. You want people who have powers of endurance. People who have wisdom. They can put up with difficulties to inspire you to put up with difficulties. There was one time when John Fung was going to have an all-night sit without much advance notice. I had been working hard that day. I told him I didn't think I could do it. And he said, well, do you think it's going to kill you? Well, no. He said, then you can do it. Well, that question you hear every now and then in the forest tradition, are you afraid to die? Now, in any other culture, the obvious answer would be yes. In that culture, you'd be embarrassed to say yes. They're expecting a greater nobility out of you, which is why this is such a good culture for the purpose of becoming responsible. So the respect and the nobility are all part of becoming a respectable person yourself, a noble person yourself. 
because that's what's required in this path. So the culture is all, all part of it. The system of values is all part of it. The Buddha didn't just discover a Vipassana technique. He discovered how cause and effect operate in the world. And he also discovered what's the best use of that knowledge. All the things he came to learn about rebirth, about karma, about how suffering happens. He would all invest into what is the best use of this? That's a value question. And when your values are noble, you're going to come up with a noble answer to those questions. That's what this culture is for.